Good day, everybody, and welcome to a new podcast with myself and Charlie Stevenson, where two middle-aged white blokes will complain about how difficult it is being middle-aged white blokes with secure jobs in the financial industry and uh, see how that goes. <laughs> Today, we're very happy to be joined by Frank from Conquest Resources and Rowan Thorne, who's an exploration geologist I've been working with recently in Liberia. How's everyone doing? Good, good. How are you doing? Yeah, so maybe, uh, Charlie, um, if you want to start just by, I think you had some news from some of your companies there. Maybe you want to give us a quick rundown of what's going on in the world of SI Capital. Oh, certainly. So the main bit of news out this week has been from a company we did a financing uh, not too long ago called uh, Charrot Gold uh, Holdings. So it's listed in London. Uh, Charrot Gold currently have one producing asset over in Armenia, but the news that was out uh, this week was a uh, bank called Feasibility Study over in uh, the Kyrgyz state at, I'll try and pronounce this one correctly, is the Tulkabash uh, project. So this is a um, copper op- uh, sorry, gold oxide um, deposit, which uh, they're looking at turning into a simple open pit heap leach project. And uh, the bank of Feasibility Study has brought up some quite interesting points about it, um, which listing them off. Currently, uh, the resource, which grew by 25%, has actually seen a decrease in the um, measured uh, category uh, due to uh, the basically the modeling, choosing to have a tighter drill spacing. Um, and uh, as a result, um, that zone uh, has basically shrunk and uh, they've basically just got more conservative uh, view on how, how the project's going to be um, developed. Um, they've also brought forward some of their um, uh, what should you call it? Uh, expansion plans. So it's increased the capex slightly, but um, end piece and the bit that I'm most interested in is the financials. And we're now looking at... Um, it's kind of a 180, so one thousand eight hundred dollars an ounce um, gold price. We're talking about MPV five of uh, one hundred fifty one million and IRR of thirty eight percent. So it still looks very attractive, and especially as this is the oxide zone to a larger, much much more extensive um, sulfide zone. Um, it should be quite an interesting project. So. See if you guys have got any questions about the project and see if I can answer them. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I missed where, where it was. I want to hear you pronounce that, that name again. The Kyrgyz state. The Kyrgyz Kyrgyz Republic. Republic. Kyrgyz Republic. There we go. I can get that one right at least. What's, I, mean, I mean, that's a pretty new one to me. What's the environment like out there for, for mining, for, for companies operating? So at the moment, it's actually... Got a bit of news on it, mostly focused around uh, TSX listed um, Centera. So they have both got um, projects over in the Kyrgyz uh, Republic as well as over in uh, Canada. But um, what's interesting is last year there was a bit of disruption going on uh, around the elections. Um, the new uh, government has come to power. Um, in particular, now I'm going to try again pronounce this guy, this gentleman's name, is President Japor- Japorova. Japorov. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm completely massacring this uh, guy's name. So I can you can you say the name in Welsh, Rowan? It might make more sense. <laughs> I do. <laughs> sure. Anyway, he came to power. He's he's been a, he's a quite a nationalist uh, gentleman, um, and he's got a lot of concerns about uh, the Centera uh, um, operation um, Komoto um, and uh, as this mine produces about 10% of the country's GDP it is pretty important to the country so um, we're looking at uh, so what's happened most recently about that is the government have stepped in and decided to take control of this asset managerial wise, and now they're asking for uh, like 51% of um, the actual country <laughs> asset. So it's an interesting situation for them to be in. Um, Charis have come out and said that, well, this doesn't apply to them. Um, they haven't got the same environmental issues 
as what um, Sintera have been trying to deal with or historically had uh, accusations about. And um, they don't have that same historic um, confrontation with the local government. So they've got a lot more um, kind of in-country relationships. Um, it's actually something I quite liked about their um, Armenia asset. That was, they took that one on over from um, who had been having a whole load of uh, kind of uh, not riots, what's another word for a riot? A uh, protest. <laughs> That's there, a way to <laughs> there you go. Yeah, no, well, often, often <laughs> in mining, protests and riots, they come hand in hand, don't they? A uh, mining PR anyway. statement that starts with, what's another word for a riot? <laughs> 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 well, well, what happened there was um, basically there had, there was a lot of um, basically uh, expats working on the project. Um, once um, Charit got a hold of it, they've turned it around in putting the local Armenians in charge of their own project, really, and uh, incorporating the locals into higher managerial roles and they brought in a yeah. um uh, i think it's an armenian canadian a lot of experience and it just suits very well it's very good for that kind of social dynamic and i think they're going to do the same over in the kyrgyz state so um kyrgyz republic where were they where were where was sharat working in armenia i'm only asking because i worked there myself a couple of years ago i was down in um, a city town called kapan in the south and that's where polymetal were working. That'll be the Kapan line, yes. That's yeah, that's the that's operation name. Yeah, yeah. How how was it back then? I liked I loved it down there. Um, but this was before all the issues arose. When I think this was before, just before polymetal started having issues in Armenia. Because as I left there, I think this was what 2016, maybe around that time. Don't I think it's around that time. Because after I'd been there, that's when they had the political issues um, in Armenia. And then that kind of impacted on polymetal because they'd had agreements or, you know, their mining licenses were organized under the previous governance. And then you had all the political upheaval. And then polymetal being one of the main employers in the, re well, in Kapan with the mine, fell into some issues as well. And I think that's what happened there. And I was doing exploration by around Kapan in those South Caucasus mountains. And I think it was a fantastic place to work, two and a half thousand meters above sea level, looking for the old copper, copper porphyry, copper and gold epithermal systems. That's why I asked, because I was down there a couple of years ago working. And it's, it is a really good place to work. And it's very underexplored. I mean, the work I was doing was based upon old Soviet exploration from the 70s or 80s. So we just had just like a basic map in Russian and just some old test pits that they dug 40 years ago. And polymetal, like, can you go up to the mountains and just do some soil sampling and some mapping? It's not that easy there <laughs> to just go in the mountains. It's trying to get up. These, there's no access to the mountains. So it's like a walk. It's like a three hour walk up and then you're already like oh it's fine but no it's just interesting because an area i'm familiar with down in, in uh, southern armenia is very intriguing it's, it's still very underexplored really i mean you've got a lot of stuff going on in turkey same kind of geological system and, and environment but armenia is very underexplored there's just curiosity on my part having been oh, there. i mean you don't hear much about armenia really well, apart from the again recent conflicts with uh, yeah. the next door neighbours, but um, now that that started to calm down with all of the uh, Russian peacekeepers in place, it's, it's looking pretty good. They're, they're currently producing um, around 60,000 60, gold equivalent ounces. I think they're looking to somewhat uh, increase with uh, ever so slightly. And most of the work they're going to be doing there is actually exploration. They've got um, new extensions to the mine, and so, so they're, they're progressing well on that. But that's the smaller end of what Jarrett wants to do. Oh, yeah. um, this Kyrgyz project, they're going to be going from, well, once they've got the uh, Tukulbash project in operation, that's another 95,000 ounces of gold. And then eventually they're going to have this um, 
Kizzle, Kizzle Tash project um, put into production. And that's, they're talking about another 200, 300,000 uh, ounces coming out of that. that. That's a big, big goal Impressive. got there to mm -hmm. put into production. So, yeah. Sounds on the whole like you guys have done a lot more research for this podcast than me. Um, <laughs> Mine's experience. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was prepared to read out some headlines, um, but, you know, we, we'll have a go. Um, yeah, moving on to news from Spotlight sponsors who are now going to hire Charlie and fire me. Um, <laughs> uh, this week, uh, Endura Metals uh, hit 1,277 grams a tonne of silver. Uh, on their Cuba project uh, and defined an IP anomaly of 1,500 metres, uh, which they believe could be connected to the Charchi deposit, which is pretty exciting up in British Columbia. Uh, Goldplay Mining uh, founded their advisory board with Walter Coles Jr. from Skeena Resources uh, joining uh, off the back of that success. Uh, they've also just uh, completed a financing, so they're cash in the bank, ready to hit the mountains. Uh, Mountain Boy Minerals have announced their field program in British Columbia as well. Uh, they're going to be hitting American Creek pretty soon, as far as I know. The snow has cleared and they're ready to go. Uh, Mammoth Resources extended their placement from 2 million to 2.5 million. Uh, from the rumors I've heard, it may, it could extend again. Uh, there's a lot of demand on that. Uh, so that's great uh, with drilling plans immediately after the placement with the money. So. Uh, also, Origin Exploration, which is one uh, you may recognize some of the panel from, uh, received some pretty good assay results, uh, but we'll be covering those later in the week. Uh, looking forward to announcing that to you all. And I suppose moving on from uh, those well-researched, in-depth you know, news releases, <laughs> uh, Frank, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, buddy? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, very well. Sorry to keep you quiet there. I, uh, Armenia is probably not a specialist topic of yours. So. <laughs> Uh, it's not, but uh, I'm glad to follow the well-researched uh, topic of discussion there. Yeah. So, I mean, for our British listeners, uh, maybe you could just introduce uh, Canada to us. Uh, many British people don't seem to be aware of the TSX or what's going on out that way. Maybe just a brief rundown of, uh, of Canada and Canadian news of late. Yeah, well, Canada's news, uh, without touching on the uh, mining aspect of it, has been mostly focused on COVID and the pandemic. Um, we seem to be uh, progressing through the uh, millions of stages we've seemed to now reach. Um, but in terms of mining, I think that there's been a focus on the uh, copper side of, of mining specifically, just because of its demand and where the market is headed to. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think that's realistically where we're headed. I think that Canada will see a spurt of growth in copper exploration projects um, with now bigger players looking to move towards the market, uh, BHP being one of them. Um, I know there's been a few others in the, uh, in the news as of recent, but yeah, I think, I think there's exciting things to come for Canada in line with the market sentiment right now. And you'll see a lot of big players moving away from potentially Southern America moving to more North. Yeah. And a question which has been conveniently answered for me by the uh, government and people of Chile, uh, which I asked uh, Claudia Tonquist a couple of months ago, uh, could North America feasibly complete, compete with South America on copper? <laughs> um, Specifically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now it looks like it's going to have to, um, to, to keep up with demand and production. Um, Conquest, you guys are exploring for new projects in copper, right? So it's fairly in a fairly early stage. Maybe just introduce those to us. Sure, yeah. Um, we have we we are in a greenfield exploration stage. That's pri that's primarily what Conquest is is uh, is after right now. We're a mineral exploration company focusing on base metals and gold properties in in Ontario specifically. Um, we do hold uh, some well diversified assets in our portfolio in some of the most prolific mining jurisdictions uh, you have in, in Canada. Um, they all are in Ontario. They, we, we have properties in, in the Red Lake Mining District, uh, in the uh, Sudbury, uh, next to the Sudbury Mining Camp, um, and also the Wawa East Gold Camp. Now it's sort of well spread across Ontario, but primarily we're focusing on our Belfast Tech Meg project. This is located in the Tomogamy Mining Camp uh, in Emerald Lake, Ontario. So just 50 kilometers northeast of Sudbury. Um, and 
under 50 kilometers northeast of the most prolific mining camp in Canada, of course, being the Sudbury mining camp. So, uh, you know, to touch on uh, recent news releases, as, as uh, Charlie did, um, we have consolidated that property. Now we have 350 square kilometers, over 350 square kilometers in in uh, our Belfast Tech Mag project area, and that we've now identified a 10,000 meter drill program um, to test approximately 15 targets and uh, well, geophysical anomaly targets that we've identified through our V10 Max Airborne surveys. Yeah, and uh, I, most people uh, of late associate Canada with sort of porphyry style projects uh, out in British Columbia. Uh, that's not what you guys are after, right? No, we are after primarily on this, on that project, we are primarily after the high grade massive sulfide copper. Um, but that's not to limit us to an exploration approach. It's, it's very diversified. We also are after the classic VMS style deposit that you'd find in the Sudbury mining camp. Uh, nickel, of course, uh, iron hosted and paleo placer gold as well. Um, it's, it's very diversified just being in the location we are. Um, now I say copper is the primary focus because of the first phase of exploration, <clears throat> excuse me, um, because we're located in the same township as the former producing Tomogamy Copperfields mine. Uh, this mine was, uh, was discovered by Tech Resources and the Kievels, the doctor, the Kievels who played a very vital role in developing Tech Resources. And that project, the Tomogamy Copperfields mine, had actually enabled them to advance a lot of their other projects. And now that has become the tech resources that, you know, I'm sure everyone knows. Um, so it's it's very encouraging to be located in the immediate vicinity of that mine that had produced, I believe, I mean, I, I'm roughly speaking here, but I believe $34 million of copper um, in that time, which, which you know, back then uh, uh, was a significant number. I prefer rough numbers anyway. If anyone gives me anything to six decimal places, I know it's been made up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what is it? 80% of eighty percent of stats are made up. Well, Frank, I've got a question for you here. Um, so we've got a couple of uh, I guess companies who uh, are corporate clients of ours, uh, one of them being uh, Panther Metals and uh, the other one Power Metals, both working in Ontario. You're talking about COVID and the restrictions over there. What's the field season looking like? To my understanding, uh, it's not something I'm directly involved in managing, but uh, in its initial stages, it was difficult to um, assemble teams and perform the field exploration that uh, for, for a company similar to ours. But um, as things have been progressing, the barriers have been much lower. I think that it, all is back to normal, and I don't think there's many concerns in terms of uh, – uh, COVID restrictions now that most of the population is expected to have their doses of vaccine come midsummer. So I, I don't think they're, uh, I don't think it's, it's, I think in the initial stages it had halted a lot of operations across Ontario specifically, but now we are seeing uh, production starting to operate at full capacity again. Yeah. Well, something I'm, I guess, just following from in Australia is difficulty of getting your hands on dual rigs and different um, states in Australia being cut off from each other. It's right. Amazing how much each, each uh, Queensland and uh, West Australia, they, they might as well be different countries. Um, is that kind of the same totally. in Canada? Or yeah, I think, freedom? yeah, I, I think so. I, I think that obviously the States, uh, it, it seems as though just generally speaking, the States is uh, less strict in terms of their policies regarding the pandemic and COVID. Um, of course, I'm speaking loosely. I'm not a politician by any means, but it just seems that way looking from the outside. Um, but I believe now Ontario's reached a point where we, we have to just simply progress in terms of our mining operations. Um, you know, a lot of executive teams have been sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to progress. And we find ourselves at a stage now that we're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah. And I suppose it's probably the most sensible project we're going to discuss today, um, <laughs> being in Ontario with uh, Charlie in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, we're going we're gonna to ask Rowan now about a country 
people don't normally associate with mining, not for a long time, but it is the world's largest producer of several industrial materials, including slate. There's the Cupara Pizarras mine, uh, which produces, I think, 70% of, of Europe's slate uh, in Spain, yeah. in Southern Europe. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we obviously, I mean, as uh, Frank alluded to um, just now when he was talking about Ontario, you wouldn't think Ontario with copper historically <clears throat> as anything, you know, interesting in regards to exploration. Does it mean most of the <clears throat> copper production uh, recently has been South America? Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, Spain has that historical, <clears throat> excuse me, um, copper. Uh, mining history. I mean, I've I've actually um I worked in Spain for about six years um, in exploration there, way before the whole copper boom as we have it now. Um, and I'm quite familiar with the different mining regions. You know, you've got the Galicia in the north with the gold, <clears throat> but what we're talking about is more the southern uh, around Sevilla, Andalusia, Cordoba, about which, of course, historically was the main source for copper in most of Europe. And as far back as Roman times, you know, your copper, gold, silver, all being mined 2,000 years ago and earlier. We should probably regions. mention Rio Tinto as well, like the name yeah, of the <laughs> we'll chuck Rio Tinto in there, actually, to give them a big shout out. So you've got Rio Tinto obviously originating from uh, Spain. True, but obviously now around that region in Sevilla, you've got uh, companies such as Pan Global Resources, Italia Mining, and they are now really seriously starting to ramp up their exploration in the region. I mean, this is quite probably the first time that any serious copper exploration has been undertaken in Europe for quite a while. <clears throat> I am aware, obviously, of some uh copper production in you know sweden finland which i'll come to but really it's the first time that the markets have started paying attention to what's going on in spain um i was just looking at the intercepts that um pan global have had recently you know they've they hit about 46 meters of one percent copper the other day something like that and some of their intervals around the 20 20 meter intervals at 1.2 1.5 percent copper so of course, these aren't porphyry systems. This is the Iberian pirate belt. You're not going to get big porphyritic uh, grades, but these grades are pretty decent and they're usually laterally extensive. So you might not have the, the width, but you've got the extent here that can be exploited. So I think, especially now with the projection for copper into the future hitting $15,000 uh, $15, a ton, you know, these, these areas are going to start seeing some serious investment and activity uh, and as i've been reading in the last few days <clears throat> italia mining plan global resources they're all starting to put holes in the ground they've got money going into the bank to do more exploration so there's great interest back in spain for your base metals especially copper and of course it's not just copper there you've got your silver you've got gold credits that will come in from these holes lead zinc there are historical antimony also, which is one of the EU's uh, identified as a critical uh, metal. So there's a lot going on. And maybe from a European perspective, British European perspective, mining can become more centralized in Europe uh, to secure supply. And obviously with the ESG side of things becoming of great prominence now, as it should be in exploration mining, if you're going to produce batteries, in the EU for electric cars, and you're going to need copper cobalt, you're going to produce it on your own doorstep. And let's look at the, the system in, in Spain, for example. These are historical mining regions. A lot of this activity is happening around historical mines, brownfields. It's not, you know, environmentally, it's not having a very big impact as a greenfield project in the middle of nowhere. You know, these are, you know, near mine, historical mine working. So, from an environmental Spain, perspective. For Spain specifically, like I, I'm going to butcher yeah. the numbers, but I think they, they made a government announcement recently and uh, it was in El Pais. They want to go 100% carbon neutral by 2035, uh, yeah. but they're banning <laughs> all or all mining and uranium. and <laughs> um, So obviously that's, yeah, uh, definitely nuclear they banned, right? Definitely um, uranium. I mean, obviously in... So they're going to need countries. quite a bit of copper <laughs> to make yeah. those wind turbines. <laughs> Exactly. It seems I mean, like, 
Yeah, yeah. It seems like the world's in search for that high-grade copper. Uh, I, I'm uh, speaking on Ontario. It's it's been the the demand is for the high-grade nature. I think there's a c concern across the uh, market that the search for the high-grade copper that it's historically been found is is going to be tough to find, and that's why I think there's such a demand for it. Um, speaking for uh, on behalf of Canada. Oh, so. sure. Well, we've seen, um, uh, certainly in London, lots of people now starting to go for these more high-grade uh, projects. And going back to old existing areas and going back through the historic data, got um, Stillo Copper over in Queensland. They, all they've done is gone back up to Queensland, find old historic data uh, with drill holes, which has just been left by majors. And some of this some of this data is fantastic. We've got one particular target uh, that they're actually looking to drill in in the coming months um, called ARIA. Uh, it's, it's pretty deep, um, but I think this is what's going to happen with most of these projects. Um, it's something around, well, I say pretty deep, about 400 meters depth, but it's a massive geophysical um, anomaly, which is on the strike, um, uh, like the Mount Isabelt area we're talking about here. And uh, it's on strike to some other fantastic copper projects. They've, they've got their own target that they've been drilling out called, um, uh, I think it's called the big one, uh, and um, then they've got um, that they didn't they didn't name it that. It was, yes, previously named, um, and uh, and then south of them is a reasonably profitable. Well, it's, it's quite a big profitable a mining operation called. Um, with, yeah, uh, I forget the name, um, but uh, anyhow, it is. It, they've got Good no quality listening. <laughs> There's some the copper in Australia. What's that I've called? Is it a riot? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that one. You know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> anyhow, um, yeah, no, so, so they're, they're drilling that. And I think that's going to be a, a huge play. Greatland Gold, again, they had a historic um, kind of sniff on a drill bit and uh, went after that, made the fantastic discovery, which is Javier on. Um, you've got now Cyprus. That was a well-known exploration area. Again, people going back in there, Chesterfield, Ariana Resources, um, Ceres um, Resources also there. Um, they're even looking at reprocessing these really old tailings over in Cyprus. So a bit like Spain, um, that then, yeah, there's so a lot of Somebody pitched me a copper project the other week with 0.2% copper in the tailings or something, and they were saying <laughs> it'd be viable. Anyway, guys, I think it's probably time. We're about to hit our 30 minute cutoff. Um, I think people are probably tired of listening to us anyway. We could ramble forever. <laughs> so I'm going to put you all on the spot, starting with Frank. Uh, 10 second takeaway for the week. And one company uh, that you'd invest in this week, if, uh, if you could. Uh, and we'll come back to it next week and see how it's done. <laughs> well, I believe, are we talking about the mining industry? Well, I see you, you can diverge from the topic of the podcast if you want, but yeah, <laughs> I, no, I just say, yeah, I was I hoping for mining. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I like what uh, I like what Wallbridge is doing in the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. I think they're a, uh, a strong investment uh, at this time. They've advanced a lot of their projects and have uh, reported some very encouraging results as of late. Good stuff. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to that uh, at the end of the week. And Rowan, same question, takeaway for the week, and. Uh, and a stock you'd pick for the week? Take away from the week. Uh, I'd say watch the copper market. Watch, watch what, what these smaller copper explorers are doing for for the time being. Obviously, these what might historically be small intercepts, lower you know smaller deposits, might become very profitable and very economic in a few few years time. Um, a stock I'd watch. I'd, I'd keep watching Plan Global uh, with their drilling in Spain right now uh, and see how they get along. It's good to see some, you know, exploration and, and, and work being done on the EU's doorstep if they want to become a leader in electric vehicles and renewable energy in the next 15 years. So, yeah. And Charlie, 10 second takeaway and a stock. <laughs> 10 second takeaway. Well, this week definitely seen a lot of um, macro influences on the copper price. Um, not to go into too much depth, but we're looking at issues or disruptions in Congo. We've had previously China trying to um, slow down um, or control the price of copper prices. So for me, um, without picking a specific stock, I'm, I'm going to just say 
coffee producers and ones who would actually got drill drill bits turning. That's where I'm looking. Good stuff. And I suppose my takeaway is don't do what everybody else is doing. So if everybody else says copper, <laughs> I'm going to go and look at gold. <laughs> um, so while the attention is turned, uh, Mammoth Resources, one I mentioned earlier, I'm already a shareholder, so very biased, but uh, their stock price is flying on announcement of drilling. And I just think tiny market cap, big potential, lots of historic data. So that'll be my pick for the week. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to our inaugural podcast. Uh, you can follow us all on Twitter. Uh, Frank, what's your channel? Conquest Resources. Well, at Conquest Resources, yes. Good stuff. Charlie? I'm at Geology Charlie. We can follow the rest of the team at SI Capital um, on our, on our uh, website and uh, on Twitter, of course. And Rowan, I don't know if you're... Uh, I'm not in the geological sphere on social media, but I'm obviously on LinkedIn under my name. And I'm obviously being public with stuff with origin exploration as well and other bits and pieces floating around in the LinkedIn sphere I'll be around. To be honest, we'll give our contact info. It's probably best to find us down the pub. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. So in terms of bias for this podcast, uh, just be aware that uh, we may or may not own shares in the companies we've mentioned. Uh, so the news may be uh, subject to preferential discussion. <laughs> Um, always do your own research before spending any money. Uh, we haven't made any recommendations here. We're just having a chat. Um, and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Any suggestions, any feedback, get in touch. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Have a great week, everybody. Cheers, Cheers as well.